record number of Americans, upwards of 67 million, go to the polls to elect the 35th President of the United States. Citizens from Maine to Hawaii record their choices as the attention of the entire globe focuses on the contest for the leadership of the most powerful nation of the free world. The Democratic nominee is an early favorite, and first returns bear out predictions in Mr. Kennedy's favor. But GOP standard bearer Richard Nixon is staunchly supported, not least by President Eisenhower, who is up early, arriving at 6.18 a.m. at Cumberland Township, Pennsylvania, near his Gettysburg farm, to cast his ballot. Notwithstanding Ike's support, Pennsylvania's crucial 32 electoral votes were carried by Kennedy. Mrs. Eisenhower followed the president late in the day and left no doubt as to her preference as she cast her vote in the tiny Pennsylvania firehouse. Eager crowds gathered outside the West End branch of the Boston Public Library as Senator Kennedy and his pretty wife arrived at the polling place early on election day before flying on to Cape Cod to await the outcome. Vice President Nixon and his wife, Pat, vote in the playroom of a private home in Whittier, California, the Los Angeles suburb where Mr. Nixon grew up. Mr. Nixon's running mate on the GOP ticket, Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge, was almost totally overshadowed on election day by the popular concentration on the principles in one of the most strenuously contested election battles in the nation's history. Senator Lyndon Johnson, Mr. Kennedy's running mate, shared his counterpart's plight this election day as the vagaries of the popular ballot resulted in one of the closest national elections since 1916. An early lead established by Kennedy dwindled as Western and rural reports came in although a favorable trend was established in the early hours. As the Democratic Party nationally won 15 governorships and maintained its leadership in Congress and the Senate, the early Kennedy drive bogged down. Through the long hours of the night, as local districts tallied their results, the Kennedy column recorded an electoral vote frustratingly short of the 269 necessary to win. Port, Massachusetts residents, the Democratic candidate and his wife stoically waited out the returns, as did Vice President Nixon on the other side of the country, who even made a quick trip across the border for an election day lunch. That night, Mr. Nixon appeared at local GOP headquarters with his wife to the cheers of campaign workers. At almost 4 a.m., he virtually acknowledged defeat. As I look at the board here, uh, while the, there are still some results still to come in, uh, if the present trend continues, uh, if Mr. Kennedy, Senator Kennedy, will be the next president of the United States. <laughs> I want Senator Kennedy to know, and I want all of you to know, that uh, certainly if this trend does continue and uh, he does become our next president, that he will have my wholehearted support. <laughs> that followed were frustrating and baffling as the key returns hung in the ballot. Not till the middle of the next day was the victory reclinched by one of the closest margins recorded, a plurality of barely over 300,000. The unexpectedly delayed climax saw Senator Kennedy the victor with a clear margin of electoral votes. At 43 years of age, he is the youngest man ever voted into the White House and the first Catholic chief executive in the history of the nation, with victories in the Southern Bible Belt, as well as the industrial centers of the North, to attest the shattering of a long-standing political taboo. In Mr. Kennedy's first public appearance after his election, accompanied by his wife, Jacqueline, his father, financier Joseph Kennedy, makes his first appearance since the campaign began. And the weary president-elect makes his first address in his new capacity, reading aloud his answer to Mr. Nixon's message of congratulations. In reply to the Vice President, I send him the following wire. Vice President Nixon, Los Angeles, California. Your sincere good wishes are gratefully accepted. You are to be congratulated on a fine race. I know that the nation can continue to count on your unswerving loyalty 
in whatever effort you undertake, and that you and I can maintain our long-standing cordial relations in the years ahead. Sincerely, John Kennedy. To all Americans, I say that uh, the next four years are going to be difficult and challenging years for us all. The election uh, may have been a close one, but I think that there is general agreement by all of our citizens that a supreme national effort will be needed in the years ahead to move this country safely through the 1960s. I ask your help in this effort, and I can assure you that uh, every degree of mind and spirit that I possess... Half a million jam Mexico City's Plaza Zocalo in a spectacular climax to nationwide celebrations of 150 years of independence. It is a night of jubilation and fiesta for 35 million Mexicans. President Lopez Mateo sounds the bells of Dolores Hidalgo, where the cry of freedom was first sounded in 1810, and their appeal is taken up from every church and cathedral in the country. Observances more than a year in preparation erupt in a glorious festival, the biggest celebration in Mexico's 150 years of freedom. In Los Angeles, over 1,000 motion picture exhibitors and their wives from all over the United States, Canada, and Mexico are joined by Hollywood stars, producers, and directors in the Gala President's Banquet that winds up the 13th annual convention of the Theater Owners of America. The organization's Star of the Year Award is presented to Doris Day by TOA President Albert M. Picus with a special citation to Miss Day, star of UI's forthcoming picture, Midnight Lace. thousand college football fans in Boston College Stadium for a first look at Navy, considered one of the top teams in the East. Navy's Bellino connects on a long pass to John Pritchard, who charges to the first goal. The Boston College Eagles trail early in the game. But the Eagles claw back fast. Bob Farrell rounds left end to pick up 13 yards. John Amabile fires a pass to Joe Sikorsky. Another 14. John McGann carries, cuts back, and charges down to the eight-yard line before he stopped. Perot rams through the left side of the line at Boston College. Evens the score with Navy, 7-0. Third period, Navy Spooner sizzles a pass to Jim Looper on the 20. Spooner to Looper again. Navy air power for first down on the 8. Navy's putting on the pressure. Bellino carries, sweeping wide and just making it across at the corner to put the middies back in the lead. In the last period, it's full speed ahead with Bellino sparking a ground attack. And Navy uses its air arm again. Spooner heaves a guided missile to Bellino for the midshipman's third touchdown. 32 yards for the third tally and a final score of Navy 22, Boston College 7. Castro marks the second anniversary of his revolution with the biggest military parade ever staged in Cuba, featuring tanks and other heavy weapons from Russia and Red Czechoslovakia. Shortly afterwards, Castro demanded the United States Embassy drastically reduce its staff to 11 persons. It was the last straw in his long campaign of provocation and harassment. President Eisenhower broke off diplomatic relations with a message read by Press Secretary Haggerty. There is a limit to what the United States and self-respect can endure. That limit has now been reached. Our friendship for the Cuban people is not affected. It is my hope and my conviction that in the not too distant future, it will be possible for the historic friendship between us once again to find reflection in normal relations of every sort. 
Meanwhile, our sympathy goes out to the people of Cuba, now suffering under the yoke of a dictator. Laos, strategic buffer state between the Red Bloc and Free Asia, is watched with concern by all the world as fighting intensifies between communist rebel forces and the pro-Western regime. Relatively small numbers are fighting in the mountainous, densely forested land, where towns and cities are isolated bare spots, linked only by crude roads. Information on events is scanty, but America charges massive outside aid by Russia and Red China, and the Soviet concedes as airlifted supplies to the rebels. These last films show the battle in which government troops ousted rebels from Vientiane, the capital. Now a new thrust is directed against the royal city of Luang Prabang. American fleet and marine units are in readiness. The conflict widens, but hope continues that some solution can be found which will restore Laos to its status as a neutral buffer state in a crucial era. Originally, the nation was created as such a buffer by the Geneva Conference. Now it is a focus of tension, the scene of a potentially dangerous flare-up in the Cold War. When things have gotten very dull and slow Here's a darn good way to make them go Only Coca-Cola gives you that refreshing new feeling That feeling, refreshing new feeling Only Coca-Cola gives you that refreshing new feeling Get that feeling <laughs> you get sing Yes, Coca-Cola refreshes you best. With ice-cold Coke, you get the lively lift that puts a lot more zing in living. Only Coca-Cola gives you that refreshing new feeling. That feeling, refreshing new feeling. Only Coca-Cola gives you that refreshing new feeling. Get that feeling with the Coca-Cola. And now, the Coca-Cola Company invites you to enjoy... Castro marks the second anniversary of his revolution with the biggest military parade ever staged in Cuba, featuring tanks and other heavy weapons from Russia and Red Czechoslovakia. Shortly afterwards, Castro demanded the United States Embassy drastically reduce its staff to 11 persons. It was the last straw in his long campaign of provocation and harassment. President Eisenhower broke off diplomatic relations with a message read by Press Secretary Haggerty. There is a limit to what the United States and self-respect can endure. That limit has now been reached. Our friendship for the Cuban people is not affected. It is my hope and my conviction that in the not too distant future, it will be possible for the historic friendship between us once again to find reflection in normal relations of every sort. Meanwhile, our sympathy goes out to the people of Cuba, now suffering under the yoke of a dictator. Laos, strategic buffer state between the Red Bloc and Free Asia, is watched with concern by all the world as fighting intensifies between communist rebel forces and the pro-Western regime. Relatively small numbers are fighting in the mountainous, densely forested land, where towns and cities are isolated bare spots, linked only by crude roads. Information on events is scanty, but America charges massive outside aid by Russia and Red China, and the Soviet concedes as airlifted supplies to the rebels. These last films show the battle in which government troops ousted rebels from Vientiane, the capital. Now a new thrust is directed against the royal city of Luang Prabang. American fleet and marine units are in readiness. The conflict widens, but hope continues that some solution can be found which will restore Laos to its status as a neutral buffer state in a crucial era. Originally, the nation was created as such a buffer by the Geneva Conference. Now it is a focus of tension, the scene of a potentially dangerous flare-up in the Cold War. Carlsbad, New Mexico, the stage is set for the first experiment aimed at turning the wrath and power of the A-bomb to peaceful uses. The nuclear device will be exploded in a cavern a quarter of a mile deep in salt rock 
and the test is designed to give scientists some of the answers to the problems of funneling nuclear power into channels beneficial to man. The thousand foot long tunnel leads to a final bend where the explosion will be set off. The device will be a small one, equal to about 5,000 tons of TNT, a fraction of the smallest bomb in Russia's recent tests. Project Gnome is the first step in Project Plowshare, which scientists hope will lead to the ultimate use of nuclear materials for trapping underground heat to turn turbines that will generate electricity. The cavern where the blast will take place is so shielded that there is no possibility of any pollution of the atmosphere. The six million dollar project is a major step in peaceful atomic use. was a year of international tensions, compounded by crisis after crisis. It was a year of riots in Cairo to protest Lumumba's death. It was Cuba and a red regime and Castro's boast that he had always been a communist. It was Shombe and warfare in the Congo with that young nation torn asunder by civil strife. 1961 was Laos, now under the uneasy rule of a neutralist regime. And it was South Vietnam battling red guerrillas. It was the year that the Algerian war continued to pit brother against brother. This was 1961. In January, John Fitzgerald Kennedy was sworn in as the 35th president of the United States and began the momentous task of guiding the nation through the critical years ahead. It was a solemn ceremony as he took the oath of office and assumed the burden laid down by Mr. Eisenhower. President Kennedy made his first venture into personal diplomacy with a trip to Europe, conferring first with General de Gaulle, who remained unconvinced that he can or should negotiate with Russia over Berlin. Vienna was a neutral arena for a sparring match between two worlds. The men who hold the power to write tomorrow's history met, smiled, and resolved no problems. The dictator and the president, the East and the West, Constant ally in adversity, Britain received a report on his meetings from Mr. Kennedy. The bond between the two nations grew stronger. For a time, the very effectiveness of the United Nations was threatened when Dag Hammarskjöld was killed while on a peace mission to the Congo. The great apostle of peace had assumed his post in 1953 and brought to his work a dedication that won him international respect even from the Russians. They tried to remove him, but they could never question his integrity. Lieutenant of Burma succeeded Mr. Hamashol to guide the UN during the parlous times it faces. Man had his first great success in space when the Russians pushed a man across the threshold. He was Yuri Gagarin, the astronaut the Russians lionized as the first to orbit the Earth. It was the propaganda coup of the year. After the Russian flight, U.S. plans were accelerated. Commander Alan B. Shepard was sent into suborbital flight. Unlike the Russian venture, this took place in the white-hot glare of worldwide publicity. The Mercury capsule is right on course as the commander took over the controls to become the first man to guide a space craft. 115 miles up, he went 300 miles down range, right on target, and was picked up by waiting helicopters. Triumph of Alan B. Shepard, U.S. space pioneer. Following in Commander Shepard's star-studded footsteps came Captain Virgil Grissom. Everything is A-OK -okay until the heartbreaking finale. As the captain prepared to leave the capsule, explosive bolts on the escape hatch let go, and the Mercury is lost. However, the moon gets closer. The line of demarcation in the Cold War lies in Berlin. West Berlin, with its burgeoning prosperity, is a thorn in the side of the Reds. Refugees from the East escaped by the tens of thousands until the communists, in desperation, threw up their wall of hate to seal off the border. In a decade, more than four million East Germans fled their homes, causing a drain on communist Germany's economy, 
that was called no longer tolerable. Their answer, the wall. Now entire families are separated, their only communication away from a distance. This is heartbreak. This is the poignant drama not found in the reports of diplomats. A bride in the East can only wave to her mother in the West. She takes her vows in public loneliness. The border is strengthened, but still they escape. She hangs from a second story window. The red police try to pull her back. The Westerners try to free their grip. East Germans grasp any fleeting chance. A guard's back is turned, the barbed wire is slashed, and Westerners stretch forth willing hands to pull them to asylum. They gamble that a sudden rifle shot won't end their dreams, that a slip won't bring disaster. Freedom is man's most prized possession, and it is only for those who love it. Immediately following the death of Doug Hammarskjöld, the United Nations Assembly heard an historic address that established the policy of the Western world. Mr. Kennedy presented a manifesto for peace in momentous and moving words, most of them directed at the Russian delegation. Ladies and gentlemen of this assembly, the decision is ours. Never have the nations of the world had so much to lose or so much to gain. Together we shall save our planet or together we shall perish in its flames. Save it we can, and save it we must, and then shall we earn the eternal thanks of mankind and as peacemakers, the eternal blessing of God. It was the year that shaped the future of man.
delegation. The location for the meeting with Senator Ribikoff has been changed to the Red Cross tent, which is to my left. 11 o'clock, Senator Ribikoff will meet the Connecticut delegation at the Red Cross tent. How many deaths will it take till he knows that too many people have died?
together. We're going to moan together. We're going to groan together. And after a while, we'll say, freedom, freedom, freedom now. give you Mr. Burt Lancaster. All Americans traveling no matter where in the world today are in the position of ambassadors and are very often made bitterly aware of our country's reputation. It is not easy to be an American abroad, nor is it easy to make coherent to those who are not Americans the nature and the meaning of our struggle. And we are therefore forever indebted to those Americans represented by the March on Washington movement for giving us so stunning an example of what America aspires to become and for helping us to redefine in the middle of this dangerous century, what is meant by the American Revolution. We recognize that it is not only in America that the battle for freedom and dignity of peoples is being waged. The struggle toward freedom on the part of the previously subjugated is occurring in capitals and villages all over the world. It is on our awareness of what this struggle means and in the degree of our dedication to it that our futures and the future of the world depend. champion of civil rights in America. Mr. Roy Wilkins, Executive Secretary, National Association for the Advancement Party. I want some of you to help me win a bet. I want everybody out here in the open to keep quiet. And I want to hear a yell and a thunder from all those people who are out there under the trees. Let's hear you.
one of them in the tree. Let us bow our heads in prayer. God of history and of all mankind, God of Abraham and Moses, Amos and Isaiah, Jesus and Paul, God of our weary years, God of our silent years, pour out thy benediction upon the United States of America. Pour it out upon President Kennedy. <laughs> However, we know that this is not going. We believe that it's going to have its effect on the image of our country all over the world because it will indicate that not only are Negroes struggling to achieve a transition from second class to first class citizenship, but that our white brothers and sisters a marching arm in arm with the Negro citizens of the country for the purpose of achieving this objective. And consequently, this is and has been a great American experience. I think it's Roman Catholic group interracial commission, which was represented here, that we, I think, proved that our judgment was right the thing we wanted to do was to get in behind the leadership of the Negro community. Clearly, the religious leader of this occasion was Martin Luther King, and uh, we are proud to have served behind and strengthening the witness that he's been carrying. The other thing is that we did produce a non-segregated march. Find the answers in the light of reason. Can we be certain that the apostles of hatred will not search for the answers in the darkness of night? And I believe that the real significance of what we have started here today is that we have laid the groundwork for the building of a functioning, broad coalition of Americans from all walks of life, from all points of view, from all races and creeds and color, who can carry on not only the common struggle to achieve an effective and meaningful civil rights legislation, but who can do this practical work, the day-to-day -day job of fighting discrimination in education, in housing, in employment, in public accommodations. And I think this is the true significance of what we have started today. Pleasure now to present the moral leader of our nation, one who has conducted a massive moral campaign in the southern area of the nation against the citadel of racism. Dr. Martin Luther King, J.R. Thank you, Mr. Randolph. I would simply like to say that I think this has been one of the great days of America. And I think this march will go down as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, uh, demonstrations for freedom and human dignity ever held in the United States. I
good president, the friend of all people of goodwill, a believer in the dignity and equality of all human beings, a fighter for justice, an apostle of peace has been snatched from our midst by the bullet of an assassin. The voice is that of Chief Justice Earl Warren. Our nation is bereaved. The whole world is poorer because of his loss. But we can all be better Americans because John Fitzgerald Kennedy has passed our way. Ambassador Adlai Stevenson. And so we shall never know how different the world might have been had fate permitted this blazing talent to live and labor longer at man's unfinished agenda for peace and progress for all. Only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. John Fitzgerald Kennedy assumed the office of President of the United States as his nation faced the great challenges of a new age. He pledged leadership, and in time, Americans would find in his words a voice, in his ideals a faith, and a direction in the goals he set for himself and his country. This film is dedicated to the goals, the faith, and the ideals of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, as they were expressed in his own words during his administration of barely a thousand days. I sometimes think we are too much impressed by the clamor of daily events. Newspaper headlines and the television screens give us a short view. They so flood us with the stop press details of daily stories that we lose sight of one of the great movements of history. Yet it is the profound tendencies of history and not the passing excitement that will shape our future. Space is open to us now, and our eagerness to share its meaning is not governed by the efforts of others. We go into space because whatever mankind must undertake, free men must fully share. I believe that this nation should commit itself 
to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. But in a very real sense, it will not be one man going to the moon. It will be an entire nation, for all of us must work to put him there. In a thousand days, he articulated for the nation the challenges of the 1960s. To fulfill the role we cannot avoid on the world scene, we must re-examine and revise our whole arsenal of tools. First, we must strengthen our military tools. We are moving into a period of uncertain risk and great commitments in which both the military and diplomatic possibilities require a free world force so powerful as to make any aggression clearly futile. If we are to keep the peace, we need an invulnerable missile force powerful enough to deter any aggressor from even threatening an attack that he would know could not destroy enough of our own forces to prevent his own destruction. For as I said upon taking the oath of office, only when our arms are sufficient beyond doubt can we be certain beyond doubt that they will never be employed. Historians report that in 1914, with most of the world already plunged in war, Prince Bulow, the former German Chancellor, said to the then Chancellor, Bethmann Hallwig, how did it all happen? And Bethmann Hallwig replied, ah, if only one knew. If this planet is ever ravaged by nuclear war, if 300 million Americans, Russians, and Europeans are wiped out by a 60-minute nuclear exchange, if the survivors of that devastation can then endure the fire, poison, chaos, and catastrophe, I do not want one of those survivors to ask another, how did it all happen? And to receive the incredible reply, ah, uh, if only one knew. Pledged to turn swords into plowshares, John F. Kennedy launched the first step toward the control of arms bringing hope to an age of danger. Every man, woman, and child lives under a nuclear sword of Damocles, hanging by the slenderest of threads, capable of being cut at any moment by accident or miscalculation or by madness. The weapons of war must be abolished before they abolish us. Our representatives have met at the summit and at the brink. They have met in Washington and in Moscow, in Geneva, and at the United Nations. But too often these meetings have produced only darkness, discord, or disillusion. Yesterday, a shaft of light got into the darkness. Negotiations were concluded in Moscow on a treaty to ban all nuclear tests in the atmosphere in outer space and underwater. This treaty is not the millennium, but it is an important first step, a step towards peace, a step towards reason, a step away from war. It is much easier to make the speeches than to make the judgments, the president had said. If you take the wrong course, and on occasion I have, the president bears the responsibility, quite rightly, so that finally it comes down that no matter how many advisors you have, frequently they are divided, and the president must finally choose. So it was whenever crisis threatened the well-being of his nation. So it was in the fall of 1962, when it was learned that in Cuba, 
90 miles from the shores of the United States, the Soviet Union had begun building missile emplacements. In this crisis, both the nation and the man were tested for the will and the courage to defend freedom. The president ordered a military quarantine of Cuba and bluntly declared that the Russians must halt what he called this clandestine, reckless, and provocative threat to world peace. The line had been drawn. A challenge that invoked the specter of a nuclear confrontation had been issued. This was the burden that John Kennedy accepted. This was the crushing responsibility that was his. It was so in Berlin and Vietnam. It was so in the Congo and in the United States. And his concern would range from the state of the nation's economy to the inviolable rights of man. Now the time has come for this nation to fulfill its promise. The fires of frustration and discord are burning in every city, north and south. It is not enough to pin the blame on others, to say this is a problem of one section of the country or another. A great change is at hand, and our task, our obligation, is to make that revolution, that change, peaceful and constructive for all. Of his thousand days as president, some of the most memorable moments occurred when he left the capital to tour his nation and the world. In Washington, he would say, we talked of the United States, its dangers and its opportunities in a somewhat removed way. But out here, one can sense the power, the strength, the resources of this nation. Here, too, he could feel the response to his administration, the respect, the admiration, the affection that Americans felt for him. Sure of his way, here was tangible proof to him that where he led, the nation would follow. With the nations of Latin America, he forged the Alliance for Progress, and he came to symbolize the dignity and liberty it promised to the people of this hemisphere. I uh, shall return to Washington and tell the uh, people of my country that uh, you and they are bound together in one of the great adventures of human experience to make of our hemisphere a bright and shining light for all the world. And in the 1960s, I believe that we can demonstrate so that all the world will want to follow our example that freedom and prosperity can move hand in hand. I express our thanks to you. And I can tell you that the people of my country, in good times and bad, are committed to the progress of your people and this hemisphere. Ladies and uh, gentlemen, uh, Mr. President, uh, one of the uh, Kennedys uh, does not need an interpreter, so I'd like to have my wife uh, say just a word uh, to you. Estas cosas deberían estar al alcance de todos y no limitarse a unos pocos afortunados. the city of Berlin, John F. Kennedy embodied the resolute determination of the United States to preserve the way of freedom. citizens of Berlin, and therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berliner.
In Paris, as in every city he visited, the people cheered him as they would his nation, for the two were indivisible. And to all the world, he carried the image of youth, strength, and vigor. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Minister, Mr. Secretary of State, Ambassador Alphonse, Ambassador Gavin, Ambassador Bonet, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I do not uh, think it altogether inappropriate to introduce myself to this audience I am the man who accompanied Jacqueline Kennedy uh, to Paris, and I've enjoyed it. That which came to be known as the Kennedy style took many forms. Often it was a quip and a smile. I uh, spoke a year ago today to take the inaugural, and I'd like to paraphrase a couple of statements I made that day by saying that we observe tonight not a celebration of freedom, but a victory of party. For we have sworn to pay off the same party debt. Our forebears ran up nearly a year and three months ago. <laughs> Our deficit will not be paid off in the next 100 days, nor will it be paid off in the first 1,000 days, nor in the life of this administration, <laughs> nor perhaps even in our lifetime on this planet, but let us begin. <laughs> Remembering that generosity is not a sign of weakness <laughs> and that ambassadors are always subject to Senate confirmation. <laughs> For if the Democratic Party cannot be helped by the many who are poor, it cannot be saved by the few who are rich. So let us begin. <laughs> It might be said now that I have the best of both worlds, a Harvard education and a Yale degree. In 1952, when I was thinking about running for the United States Senate, I went to the then Senator Smathers and said, George, what do you think? He said, don't do it. Can't win. Bad year. <laughs> In 1956, I was at the Democratic Convention, and I said, uh, I didn't know whether I'd run for vice president or not. So I said, uh, George, what do you think? This is it. They need a young man. It's your chance. So I ran and lost. And in 1960, I was wondering whether I ought to run in the West Virginia primary. Don't do it. That state, you can't possibly carry. And actually, the only time I really got nervous about the whole matter at uh, Los Angeles was just before the balloting. George came up and said, I think it looks pretty good for you. <laughs> the White House, in a thousand days and a thousand nights under John Fitzgerald Kennedy, often became a center for cultural activity. And that was part of the Kennedy style. As he sought to achieve excellence in all that he undertook, so did he admire and encourage talent and genius. The poet, the artist, the musician, continues the quiet work of centuries, building bridges of experience between peoples, reminding man of the universality of his feelings and desires and despairs, and reminding him that the forces that unite are deeper than those that divide. From his incredibly broad range of interests, John F. Kennedy shaped the path of his administration. A passionate believer in the value of knowledge, he launched a broad program for improving the educational opportunities of young Americans. A witness to the tragedy of mental retardation, 
he spurred the drive for research into its causes. His conviction that individual Americans could carry abroad a new image of America produced the Peace Corps. Under John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the office of president was the vortex of action and decision. And from his goals and faith and ideals, there came a new standard for his nation, a new challenge for its people. All this in a thousand days. Ask every person if he's heard the story. And tell it strong and clear if he has not. That once there was a fleeting wisp of glory called Camelot. have to be faster than a jet to keep up with the new American fashions like this narrow coat. But stop off with us in Rome while we attempt to keep you posted. Countless tourists have made wishes at the Trevi Fountain, but what gal could wish for more than this sunny yellow and earth tone wool tweed? It features the closer to the body shaping. Hmm, it certainly does shape up. Rome's ancient statues have rarely looked on anything lovelier. Rose red and orange spongy worsted in a two-piece houndstooth dress. The authentic American look, all wool and a yard wide. She looks over the Roman forum in a worsted whipcord sleeveless shift. This shows the trend towards smoother tuck fabrics. What does she see among the ghosts of Roman senators? This vibrant at home naked wool chalet in a floral print. Where the ancients praised Caesar, she praises the inspiration of its designer. Out of the past and into your future comes this news. And the news is pleats, knife pleats for a mobile moving skirt. The closer to the body look for flattering at home wear. In these days of high fashion, wool now places this hallmark on fashions that stay in the forefront of dreams and desires. What is created on paper comes to life under skillful hands, as witness this long dinner suit in white worsted. It's a daytime fashion now allowed out in the evening, as suits become a part of the after dark scene. What could better complement romance on a balcony in Rome than this black wool crepe cocktail dress to attract that certain man? If you put it to a vote, you'd find the eyes have it. My fellow Americans, not long ago I received a letter from a woman in the Midwest. She wrote, Dear Mr. President, in my humble way I am writing to you about the crisis in Vietnam. I have a son who is now in Vietnam. My husband served in World War II. Our country was at war, but now this time it's just something that I don't understand. Why? Why Vietnam? Why Vietnam? Why Vietnam? Why Vietnam? 
Good man. Munich, 1938. German Chancellor Adolf Hitler arrives for a conference to be held here with British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain. This meeting will long be remembered, for it opens the door to the dreams of dictatorship. We regard the agreement signed last night and the Anglo-German naval agreement as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. Peace in our time. A shortcut to disaster. But even then, this was no new lesson. It had stared us in the face with Mussolini in Ethiopia. Ethiopia's emperor, Haile Selassie, made his protest to the League of Nations. But nothing was done. We'd also seen the Anschluss in Austria. And nothing was done. Then in 1950, aggression was again unleashed, this time across the 38th parallel in Korea. But free men had begun to learn the lesson, and something was done. The lesson had been learned, and President Johnson had phrased its meaning well. Aggression unchallenged is aggression unleashed. Why must young Americans, born into a land exultant with hope and with golden promise, toil and suffer and sometimes die in such a remote and distant place? The answer, like the war itself, is not an easy one. But it echoes clearly from the painful lessons of half a century. Three times in my lifetime, in two world wars and in Korea, Americans have gone to far lands to fight for freedom. We have learned at a terrible and a brutal cost that retreat does not bring safety and weakness does not bring peace. And it is this lesson that has brought us to Vietnam. For the background to our involvement in Vietnam, we must go back to a shell-cratered place called Dien Bien Phu. Supplied only by air, completely surrounded by the opposing Vietnamese, French troops are fighting the last battle of a long war over what had been called French Indochina. It's a strange three-cornered struggle. Non-communist Vietnamese fighting communist Vietnamese, and some of both fighting the French. By 1954, the inevitability of French defeat has become clear. Hanoi, in 1954, reflects the ravages of long and bitter warfare. But for now, the fighting is over. The French are leaving. The Red Star flies over Hanoi as the communist forces move in. At a conference in Geneva, an agreement has been reached. It divides Vietnam into north and south, turns over the north to the communists, and marks the end of French colonial rule. The agreement also provides the machinery for bringing true peace to Vietnam if the communists act in good faith. This is a bright victory for the communist world and there are smiles. But not on the faces of the more than one million Vietnamese who desert their homes and flee southward rather than live under a communist regime. From then to now, the basic story of United States' help to Vietnam is simple. 
The communists have steadily increased their pressure on South Vietnam. South Vietnam has asked for greater support to resist that pressure and has received it. So increasing communist aggression has called forth increases in the scope of United States counteraction. But United States policy has remained the same. We are committed to helping a free people defend their sovereignty. Let us trace the history of that commitment. In 1954, Vietnam is divided at the 17th parallel, as Korea was divided at the 38th. She faces the future with an imaginary line running from border to border, symbolizing a separation which is far from imaginary. In the north, Ho Chi Minh, communist leader of North Vietnam, plays the kindly, smiling grandfather. But behind the smile is a mind which is planning a reign of terror in South Vietnam, in which children and adults alike will be the victims. In South Vietnam, peace brings a fresh beginning. The people set about building new homes, new hopes. Free elections are held in the South alone when it becomes clear that the communist regime in the North has no intention of permitting genuinely free elections in its half of the country. Also in 1954, President Eisenhower pledges economic aid to assist the government of Vietnam in developing and maintaining a strong, viable state capable of resisting attempted subversion and aggression through military means. Land reforms redistribute farmlands in the South so that farmers own their fields and reap for themselves the fruit of their toil. With American economic aid, the South begins to prosper and the hopes of the people are for peace. These hopes, shared by so many in Southeast Asia, are reinforced in Manila when in 1955, the United States and others signed the Southeast Asia Collective Defense Treaty, forming CETO and guaranteeing the mutual security of Southeast Asia from armed aggression. But even as the people of the South build, North Vietnam is creating in their villages Political action centers with trained agitators infiltrated from the north, often in the guise of refugees. <coughs> the communist plan also includes acts of terror and subversion to disrupt the legitimate government. If the south cannot be brought under Hanoi's control by less forceful means, a new phase of the communist plan is ready to go into action. Open guerrilla warfare, furtive and remorseless, aimed at destroying the government and subjugating the people. It is called by Hanoi a war of liberation. It does not seem so to the hundreds of anti-communist leaders, teachers and their wives and children who are visited in the night by Viet Cong persuasion squads. <laughs> This is the prize the communists are after. South Vietnam, rich in rice, and standing at the gateway to the rice-rich nations of Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Burma, and East Pakistan. And the Asian communists have said, a grain of rice is worth a drop of blood. Also natural resources, coal, phosphate, zinc, tin, manganese, the raw materials on which to base industrialization or feed a war machine. Natural rubber, South Vietnam has this too. And the latex processing facilities which make of raw rubber the vitally important material it is in today's world. 
This then is another aspect of the South Vietnam which the North covets. A nation moving toward greater industrialization. A rich prize indeed in the eyes of communist strategists. At Gettysburg College in 1959, President Eisenhower clearly recognizes the danger. We have learned too that the cost of defending freedom, of defending America, must be paid in many forms and in many places. They are assessed in all parts of the world, in Berlin, in Vietnam, in the Middle East, here at home. Unassisted, Vietnam cannot, at this time, produce and support the military formations essential to it. Military as well as economic help is currently needed in Vietnam. By 1960, every area of life in the South has become a combat zone. This is a different kind of war. There are no marching armies or solemn declarations. But this is really war. It is guided by North Vietnam, and it is spurred by Communist China. Its goal is to conquer the South and to extend the Asiatic dominion of Communism. And there are great stakes in the balance. No people see this more clearly than the embattled, hard-pressed Vietnamese. By 1961, they send out an urgent call for help. The answer to that call is prompt in arriving. America promises substantial military and technical aid, machines and equipment to resist aggression, and the trained men to teach Vietnamese fighting forces how to put them into effective use. The American advisors are specialists, highly trained and motivated, often able to speak to trainees in their own language. They are called Sun Karabin, La Kaa, Bamoy, Chukki, Hau, Lap, Vatau, Ko Sung Nai, Toi Sa, Nai Kwa, Vay Nyung Ping Kaik, Kur Ko Sung Nai. Instructors and advisors willing and able to teach find men whose freedom is at stake, eager and quick to learn. At this time, however, the Americans in Vietnam are there only as advisors. There are no United States combat units as such. The advisors' primary job is to train and encourage the South Vietnamese fighting men they have come to respect and admire. This guerrilla warfare is the latest tactic in the global communist plan. Korea showed that the free world would meet and stop conventional invasion and communists' efforts to dominate newly emerging nations through trade, aid, and political subversion had little success. Now a new kind of politically camouflaged invasion must be faced, the so-called People's War of Liberation. As months go by, the communists lose a lot of men, but there are many more in the North who will be sent south to replace them and others can be kidnapped and forced to serve. Meantime, in addition to training Vietnamese fighting men, American advisor teams are working constantly to help relieve the human suffering of remote villages. Under pressure of growing communist aggression, the flow of American equipment and advisors is increased. It is the only means of meeting the rising tide of infiltration and attack from the north, especially since aggressive guerrillas with no citizenry to protect can tie up forces ten times their own number. Superior equipment and mobility are used to full advantage to carry the fight to the enemy, swiftly, wherever his presence becomes known. The Vietnamese soldier is quick to grasp the techniques involved in copter-borne counteraction to guerrilla raids on country villages, and he uses his new knowledge well. In 
Even with superior equipment, however, this is a difficult war to prosecute. There are no front lines here. The war is everywhere against an enemy that is seldom clearly seen. In these scenes of casualty evacuation, the enemy is not far away, certainly within shouting distance. The enemy is not seen, but American and Vietnamese fighting men bear on their bodies the painful evidence that he is still here, still determined, still deadly. Throughout this time, the combat capability of South Vietnam's military forces is growing. American advisors work to bring the level of training and combat readiness of these forces as high as possible. But as North Vietnam continues to send in fresh cadres, there is a growing need in South Vietnam for fighting men. The losses suffered by the South in combat are cruelly heavy for a nation whose population is no larger than that of New York State. The fact is, in proportion to population, South Vietnam's losses in combat are 10 times as great as those suffered by the United States in Korea, greater even than our total losses in World War II. Then in August of 1964, the communists again enlarged the scope of the conflict. Renewed hostile actions against United States ships on the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply. That reply is being given as I speak to you tonight. Air action is now in execution against certain supporting facilities in North Vietnam which have been used in these hostile operations. Never until now have American men and machines struck directly at communist North Vietnam. Later in August, Secretary of Defense McNamara sets the record straight. We wish to emphasize we seek no wider war. Our response will depend upon the action of the aggressors, in this case, the North Vietnamese. The key to the situation remains the cessation of infiltration from the North into the South. We seek no wider war, but we find ample evidence that there is no relenting on the part of the North. In this one captured shipment of Viet Cong arms, there are a million rounds of small arms ammunition. 3,500 rifles, submachine guns, and some 4,000 anti-tank and mortar rounds. And there's no doubt about the source. The Chinese markings are unmistakable. In meeting the aggression so clearly evidenced here, we have sent strength to meet force. But we have also repeatedly sent word that we are willing to talk as Secretary of State Dean Rusk makes plain. Our war aim in South Vietnam is peace. President Johnson has directed me to do everything possible to bring this matter from the battlefield to the conference table. And so we've been utilizing all of the existing and available political machinery for that purpose. We've attempted to use the machinery of the Geneva Conferences of 1954 and 1962 Last year, we brought the Vietnam problem before the Security Council of the United Nations at the time of the Gulf of Tonkin affair. But Hanoi refused an invitation to come to the Security Council to talk about it. The Distinguished Secretary General of the United Nations, Lieutenant, Tant, considered a peace mission himself to bring about peace, but Hanoi and Peiping told him not to come. Britain has made uh, many efforts to find a path to a settlement. First, by working toward a new conference in Geneva, and then by a visit of one of their senior statesmen, Mr. Patrick Gordon Walker. 
But the effort for a Geneva conference uh, has thus far been blocked. And Mr. Gordon Walker was told that he should stay away from Hanoi and Peiping. The Commonwealth attempted to send a committee of the Commonwealth to various capitals to explore the possibilities of peace. We welcomed that initiative, but Hanoi and Peiping uh, told them uh, not to come. We made a number of efforts on our own, both publicly and privately. President Johnson in Baltimore, for example, offered unconditional discussion uh, with the government's concerned. But Hanoi and Peiping call this offer a hoax. Seventeen non-aligned nations publicly appealed for a peaceful solution by negotiations without preconditions. We welcome this proposal, but it was rejected by Hanoi and Peiping. The distinguished president of India made a constructive suggestion that there be an end of hostilities and an Afro-Asian police force established uh, in Vietnam. To us, uh, this proposal was full of interest and hope. But by Hanoi and Red China, it was rejected as a betrayal. So all of these abrupt and violent rejections of peaceful settlement are just what they appear to be. Clear proof that Hanoi is not yet prepared for discussions. Unless it be accepted in advance that South Vietnam be subjected to communist domination. And so the record seems very clear to us. Hanoi is presently resisting the road to peace. Peiping, even more so. The declared doctrine and purpose of the Chinese communists remain clear. The domination of all of Southeast Asia. And indeed, if we listen to what they're saying to us, the domination of the great world beyond. The United States will continue to make every effort toward reasonable negotiation, and there can be no doubt as to our intention. We do not seek the destruction of any government, nor do we covet a foot of any territory. But we insist, and we will always insist, that the people of South Vietnam shall have the right of choice, the right to shape their own destiny, in free elections in the South or throughout all Vietnam under international supervision. And they shall not have any government imposed upon them by force and terror, so long as we can prevent it. We do not want an expanding struggle with consequences that no one can foresee, nor will we bluster or bully or flaunt our power. But we will not surrender. And we will not retreat. The answer to American offers to move from the battlefield to the conference table continues to come in the form of high explosives aimed at American air bases and other troop installations in the South, including the barracks of American servicemen. But in this war against people, the high explosives are not only aimed at men who bear arms. The American embassy in Saigon itself becomes a grim battleground scene as Viet Cong terrorists single it out for a bomb attack. It is all part of the carefully planned and continuing campaign of terror against both American and South Vietnamese civilians. Increasingly now, Americans are functioning directly in the fight for freedom in this far, foreign corner of the earth. The risks are real, just as the stakes for which they are taken are real. But Americans risk, and sometimes give, all that they have half a world away from home because they know that once again, half a world away has become our front door. If freedom is to survive in any American hometown, it must be preserved in such places as South Vietnam. And as President Johnson has pointed out, it is up to us. 
most of the non-communist nations of Asia cannot by themselves and alone resist the growing might and the grasping ambition of Asian communism. Because this is true, and because we are a nation which honors its commitments, and a people committed to our honor, we intend to convince the communists that we cannot be defeated by force of arms or by superior power. I have asked the commanding general, General Westmoreland, what more he needs to meet this mounting aggression. He has told me, and we will meet his needs. For the first time, combat units of the United States Marine Corps arrive in Vietnam, joining other Marines already there. It is the first time that Marines in full combat gear have hit the beach in an active combat zone since Korea. Army combat units also arrive, and the message of their presence on Vietnamese soil is plain. Whatever the present or future needs of the fight for freedom in Vietnam, they will be met. American forces in Vietnam know that the communist so-called war of liberation is no less a form of aggression than was the conventional attack in Korea. And they know that this new form of aggression must be defeated and proven unprofitable, or the communists will be encouraged to try it elsewhere with greater confidence and resources. So the war goes on. Clearly, it is the communists who have made that choice. And as always, the innocent suffer. For the children of Vietnam and of all Southeast Asia, the future is in the balance. If they are to realize their heritage as free men tomorrow, there are for us today hard realities to be faced. I do not find it easy to send the flower of our youth, our finest young men, into battle. I have seen them in a thousand streets of a hundred towns in every state in this union, working and laughing and building and filled with hope and life. But as long as there are men who hate and destroy, we must have the courage to resist. We did not choose to be the guardians at the gate, but there is no one else. Nor would surrender in Vietnam bring peace, because we learned from Hitler at Munich that success only feeds the appetite of aggression. Moreover, we were in Vietnam to fulfill one of the most solemn pledges of the American nation. Three presidents, President Eisenhower, President Kennedy, and your present president, over 11 years have committed themselves and have promised to help defend this small and valiant nation. Strengthened by that promise, the people of South Vietnam have fought for many long years. Thousands of them have died. Thousands more have been crippled and scarred by war. And we just cannot now dishonor our word or abandon our commitment, or leave those who believed us and who trusted us to the terror and repression and murder that would follow. This then, my fellow Americans, is why we're in Vietnam. <laughs>